Hey folks, Dave Polites, Canine Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel, and we're back in the silo. It is very cold outside, so I'm bundled up and we're down here. First of all, thank you for everyone who responded to my request about the reviews on Amazon. But there were a couple of people who sent me interviews and said, Dave, would you just chill out? Please don't get all upset about this kind of stuff. Folks, it's not going to happen. You see, I, I think some of you believe you know me because you watch a few YouTubes and you think you can get some insight into somebody that, that way. And I think you can. But you really don't know the true person. When I was raised, uh, it was instilled in me by my mom to do the right thing and to help people in a time of distress and to stand up for the right thing when you can. There's a story for you. Uh, I was married at one time. I was married for 17 years. And early in the marriage, my wife had to go to the UK for a business trip and she said come on come with me so at one of these meetings we were coming back on the train in London and on this one train it was probably about 536 London time I would say 70% of the people on the train were ladies in business suits and another 10% looked like students and another 20% looked like other businessmen and one or two percent look like bums. So yeah, we're on this train and there's this guy standing next to me fondling some business lady. I mean, actually going out and grabbing her and she's moving away and moving away and he keeps going over. I'm watching this go on. I'm, I wanted to make sure that this guy wasn't a friend of this woman. And then finally she said, sir, please leave me alone. Please leave me alone. And now he's starting to reach up his, her dress. And back then in London, there was a, there was a meter on the wall. And, and there, it would say, you know, 30 seconds till your next stop. Now my wife's standing right next to me and she knows I'm going freaking nuts. She goes, don't do anything, Dave, don't do anything. I go, no, no. And I'm, my blood is boiling. So, I knew he didn't have my gun, but I also knew something else. I also knew he didn't have a gun. And it was at a time in my life I was in perfect shape. And this guy, I knew I had had enough of him. Because if that was my wife, I would want somebody to step up for her. And she knew what I was thinking, my wife. So it said 30 seconds to the next stop. So I walked right up behind the guy. And I know because of defensive tactics that the closer you are to somebody, the better you are at disarming them should they pull a knife or something. So I, I wanted to be right on top of him. If he pulled a knife out, I would, I would have just put him on the ground and that would have been it. But we're coming up and I could see the train slowing down and I whispered in his ear, I said, you're getting off here. And he said, what? And I said, you're getting off here and I grabbed grabbed the coat on his back and I grabbed his his belt the door opened it's like everyone knew the people parted and I threw that guy as hard as I can as far as I could off the train I said do not get back on another train the doors closed I'd say 70 people on the train Thank you, sir. Thank you. That night, my wife said, why'd you do that? You, you could have gotten really hurt. And I said, and I explained to her. And she goes, yeah, you're right. You had to do that. And I said, I knew he didn't have a gun. And I felt like I, I controlled the situation. But there's times in this world, you got to stand up. You can't sit in the background your whole life and let others be victimized. So, 
I've watched these videos in the last month, two months, about these elderly people just getting attacked in New York, and it makes me sick. I can't, I can't believe the, the lack of kindness, the lack of goodwill, the lack of humanity that are in certain people. And uh, it disgusts me. It also disgusts the hell out of me that some people high up in our government will disband the police and take down the street crimes unit in New York and that allows this crap to go on. Really mad. So getting back to me, I don't think many of you really know me. Uh, I, would, I would just assume trade positions with someone and let me be victimized than, than them. Because you know what? At least I sent a message to that piece of garbage that's victimizing somebody. And that message is, you better think real hard the next time you do it because there may be somebody like Dave standing right next to you. I don't care where it's at. I've seen it a lot of places in my life. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I try to stay in shape because I know in my heart, if I see this happening again, I'm going to do something. And I may get hurt, but so be it. At least in my own code. And I've talked to you guys about this before. We all live by a code. The code I live by is you don't stand by. You don't stand by and let somebody be victimized. It's my code. And when I worked in the street crimes unit at San Jose, we would sometimes dress up like a bum or dress up like an addict or something and lay in the street semi-conscious. And we'd have thugs come down the street and roll us for money and then they'd be arrested by officers later on. And what we were doing was cutting down the violent crime in neighborhoods immensely because the next time that those thugs came by and saw somebody in the street like that, they didn't know if it was an officer or somebody else. Yeah. There's a lot of satisfaction out of that job. <laughs> Another story. This is, a, I swear to God, this is a true story. I, I don't mean to diminish your importance, but uh, I'm sorry I said that. Working street crimes. And uh, we would take different uh, roles. Sometimes we'd be uh, the person laying in the street, and we'd have people come and do makeup on and make us look like bombs. And then others, we'd be arrest and control officers on the perimeter. And then we had something that was called the van man. The van would be almost on top of the person laying in the gutter, be in a position, a parking space very close. And it was just an unmarked van. You'd never know what it was. But we had uh, listening devices because the person laying in the street had a transmitter on. And he also was wearing an earpiece, the person laying in the street. And the van man would be telling people around him what was happening, how many people were around him. And then immediately, immediately, if somebody had a weapon, he would tell the officer. And if that man or that individual came at the officer with a weapon, immediately that officer would come up, probably shoot the guy. And, but as it always happened, 99 times out of 100, they would just try to grab you, go through your pockets, steal whatever you had, and leave. But uh, a lot of times, after they stole something out of the pockets, they, the criminals on red alert, they're looking around, and they, after, after a couple of months, they all knew what the operation was about. And when they see a bunch of uh, officers coming at them, in plain clothes, and they kind of knew who we were, uh, the chase was on. Sometimes when we caught them, they'd fight like hell because they were two or three strikers. They, they had a couple felons. We, we, the number of hardcore people we caught doing that job was unreal. And probably the most, the most alarming case was this guy goes up to our decoy in the street and rolls them and takes the money and wallet and starts walking off like nothing's happening. And 
the van man calls for an arrest team within a block or two. Well, just as this person's clearing that first block, another guy comes towards him, and he, the, the crook is kind of looking at this guy thinking, is he a cop? And the second bad guy throws the first bad guy against the wall, and we're thinking, oh my God, it's a good citizen who just saw what happened. And the second bad guy goes through the first bad guy's pockets. He's much bigger than the first guy. Steals everything out of his pockets, puts it in his, throws him on the ground, and now he starts walking away. And we wanted to make 100% sure that he wasn't going to go back and give the stuff back to the decoy or look for an officer. And within about a block, then he starts running. And we had that one arrest team caught the guy who was robbed by the second bad guy. And then I was on the team that chased this other guy for three or four blocks, went over a couple fences, we grabbed him, took three or four of us to bring him down, and he was a third or fourth strike candidate and uh, convicted felon multiple times. And uh, he knew that if he was going to get caught for this, he could go 25 to life. So uh, it was a dangerous job lot of satisfaction out of taking these people off the street a lot and uh we were very successful in prosecutions because we went to classes about how to understand this a team of ours went to new york to work with the new york street crimes team we had other street crimes teams from all over the western u.s come and train with us and uh yeah we were, we were pretty well known for we're doing a good job at this. So as far as me standing by as something happens, it's not going to happen. As far as me allowing somebody to blatantly lie about my work, I allow it to happen more times than I should. But when somebody goes to Amazon and they blatantly lie, I'm not standing by because I know 10 people today will read those reviews on Amazon and there'll be one or two of them that think that that lie about that review is true. It's just going to happen. And people say, oh, so what? The person's an idiot that believes that. No, they're not all idiots. They don't know what to believe. And they're probably thinking, well, if it's not true, why doesn't Mr. Politis stand up and pitch a bitch about it? Oh, yeah, I did. So... You're going to hear a lot more about this, trust me. And when I did bring it up, ironically, one of our listeners here, viewers named Lola, decided to put up her own fabricated hoax BS review. And if you didn't catch it, it's on Amazon. Missing 411 Western US, I'll read it to you. Lola gave me a one out of five stars. It says, don't waste your time. Reviewed in the United States on November 3rd. Mr. Politis talks about all these cases on his YouTube channel. How Mr. Politis talks about all these cases on his YouTube channel. So the implication is, don't read the book, just watch the YouTube channel. However, his YouTube channel has turned into more of a personal circus. He speaks more about his political view views and personal issues in his son's suicide. These missing cases have taken a backseat to him blubbering literally on every YouTube show posted and his followers who have mental health issues, lost a loved one and support his political views, cheer him on, support him 100% and tell to him to continue his blubbering. Don't waste your time or dollars on this books or his YouTube channel. Hey, Lola, press flash. It doesn't cost anything to watch my YouTube channel. So they're not spending any money on it. And you don't have to spend any money on my books. You can ask for a library to get them or ask for an interlibrary transfer. Okay, Lola? On his YouTube episode posted November 3rd, 2021, he is encouraging all of his supporters to write positive reviews on his missing 411 books. I personally have never heard an author tell people to write positive reviews on their books, whether they read it or not. This is disturbing. 
Lola, you are a low life liar. And you don't have the nerve to write to me personally. Your name probably isn't even Lola. You may not even be a female. And if you had one ounce of empathy in your heart, you would have left out the part about suicide because there are a lot of people on this channel suffering right now from mental illness from a variety of causes. Some of them may be because of what you write or maybe it's your attitude in life, Lola. Maybe if you had a heart, maybe if you talk passionately, politely about some things in your world, that people would look at you differently. Deep down, Lola, you may be a really good soul. You may be a nice person. You may be someone that I'd want to be friends with. But when did it do anybody any good to attack anyone with a series of lies when you and your heart know they're not true? It's not the way you were taught, Lola. I don't believe your mom and dad would teach you those behaviors in life. So Lola, I feel sorry for you. I'm sure if you met me, you probably still consider me a piece of garbage. But one thing you'd learn, I'm not a rude person and I don't lie. So Lola, I wish you good luck in this life. And one side note, when you post something to Amazon under book reviews, maybe you could, you could at least review the book. Yeah. Okay. Now along those same lines, I get a letter from Will, and Will sends me five emails a week. <laughs> Can you please do Ben yourself and everyone else that loves and cares about you something? Ignore, ignore those effing idiots like Bemis. I've dealt with people like that, and the best thing you can do is not to think about them. A small number of blankety blanks wanting to drag you down discredit you when you have countless others agreeing with you. Do not give a crap about those people. Excuse my language. It did my head in listening to that moron's letter. I've dealt with people like that effing. Think about all the great people who have brains. Yeah, a cat buried someone, then what? Clean them, redress them, what? He's an idiot. Do not think twice about him. Thanks, Will. No, and again, friends, it's not that those people posting those idiotic reviews aren't morons. It's just an if I can get a couple of people to realize that they aren't truthful reviews, that they're not based on anything in my work, then I've succeeded. But to let them stand without hearing that at least I have a backbone, again, not going to happen. Uh, somebody sent me a note the other day about a train in Salisbury, UK that derailed and they couldn't figure out what it hit that was so heavy and so strong that knocked it off the tracks because they couldn't find anything and they couldn't come to a rational reason why. And you know what's fascinating about that? First of all, thanks for sending it. But here in north, north central Montana, not far from the Canadian border, we had a uh, passenger train that got derailed September 25th, killed three people. And the NTSB did an investigation and they stated they had no idea what caused the derailment. That's concerning. So because I know you guys are from all over the world, pay attention to train der derailments. Something weird going on there. Not sure what, Maybe just a short-term anomaly, but ask you guys to pay attention. Then one, one last comment about the book reviews somebody sent in. He said, why are there one-star reviews? I'll tell you why. I've been following David Politis for nearly 10 years. 
I've watched every episode on his YouTube and the movies, and I've read many books. The reason for the one-star reviews is people want to be told what to believe. Hmm. See, I'm just, just the opposite. I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to be told what to read. I don't want to be told what you think. I don't want to be told the facts. Let me come to my own conclusions. I do think that there's a subset of the population that wants me to say something just so they can attack it. Oh, that guy's an idiot. This guy thinks this or thinks that. Hey, folks, if I had an opinion about something in the 411 arena that I could stand behind and say, yeah, this is a fact, I'd do it. But I don't, so I won't. Everyone's sitting on the sidelines. They're just waiting. What's he going to say? How can we attack him? Ah, not going to happen. Um, once every two months, I get this magazine. Nexus. I've talked about it before. Comes out of Australia. Duncan Rhodes is the uh, owner, editor. Duncan's a great guy. Uh, I've done a, a conference there a few years ago. And after months of reading his magazine, I will tell you, it's the most enlightening, cutting edge news I've come across in any publication. Duncan isn't paying me anything for this. You should be Duncan, but you're not. But I'm telling you, every two months I look forward to that magazine because there's something in there. There's usually three or four things in there that Angie and I read cover to cover every other month. And then we pass it on to friends. Now I'm going to pass them on to you. The title of this article in the, uh, this is the September, October, 2021 edition of Nexus. The title is Lisbon court finds only 152 of 17,000 COVID-19 deaths due to the virus itself. A court, in Lis a court in Lisbon, Portugal has been forced to provide verified COVID-19 mortality data. According to the ruling, the number of verified COVID-19 deaths from January 2020 to April 2021 is only 152, not the 17,000 as claimed by the government ministries. Writing about the ruling, which only came about after public pressure, Andre Diaz, PhD, a Portuguese blogger wrote, we live in a fraud of unprecedented dimensions. While just 152 of 17,000 reported COVID-19 deaths were due to the virus, the court found after examining the medical evidence that all others died of various other ailments, but as they had a positive PCR test, they were listed as COVID-19 deaths. Portuguese activists have called for those responsible for this fraud to be tried and jailed. A similar situation has taken place in Ireland and around the world with deaths from numerous different ailments and even accidents being attributed to COVID-19 due to positive PCR tests, whose accuracy has widely been challenged. Good article. And that rolls right into the U.S. This is another article. USA ranks last in media trust, says Reuters report. A recent report from Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford has found that the United States ranked dead last in media trust among 49 countries, with just 29% saying that they trusted the media. The most tragic aspect is that it does not matter. The media has embraced advocacy, advocacy journalism, and anyone questioning that trend risks instant cancellation. The result is a type of state media where journalists are bound by ideology rather than law. The plunging level of trust reflects the loss of the premier news. Friends, do you realize where we're going with this? If the news restricts what we hear, if the news gives us what they want us to hear and what they want us to think, where are we going? What does that remind you of? Yeah, like a communist country that 
controls your news and tells the news agencies what to say, how to say it, and how to control it? Think about that. Fifty-eight percent of the voters, fifty-eight percent of the voters in the USA agree media are the enemy of the people. Fifty-eight percent of likely US voters either strongly agree, thirty-four percent, or somewhat disagree, twenty-four percent, with the statement that media are truly the enemy of the people, according to a recent survey conducted by Rasmussen. The survey also asked how serious of a problem is fake news in the media. 83% of likely voters said it was either very serious, 55% somewhat serious. The majority of you out there know what, where we're going. And that is bad. And then, uh, <laughs> many of you know I talk about Wikipedia and Duncan. Did you watch my shows and see that maybe you ought to address Wikipedia? Because he does in a big article in this edition. And it talks about how Wikipedia is a partner with Google. When you Google a question, a question like, let's say, uh, who was the fourth president of the United States? Google will go and high up on their list of credible sources is Wikipedia. That's right, folks. Google search considers Wikipedia a credible source. Many of you have asked me, well, Dave, can't you just go in and edit your own Wikipedia page? <laughs> yeah, right. If I did, 20 seconds later, the old, old one would be back up. Yeah, that's right. About five years ago, I brought this topic up because they were, it was just complete slander and it was lies. And uh, there were some high-end editors in Colorado that worked with Wikipedia, and they had donated a lot of money to the cause. And they said, Dave, give me 12 hours, I'll have this fixed, and it'll be factual. 12 hours, 24, 36, the guy gets a hold of me and he goes, I've been with Wikipedia for many years, and I've edited many pages, and I've corrected many pages, and I've never seen the roadblocks that are placed in front of me with yours. I said, Dave, something's going on. Give me a few more days. A couple more days go by. The senior editor comes back and goes, Dave, I just quit Wikipedia. I was part of that organization because I believed in their goals, presenting factual information. He goes, I won't, I won't ever give them money again because they're fabricating and they won't let me fix those blatant mistakes on your page. As an example, one of you uh, apparently did your own archive search on a couple things, and they sent, you sent me an article where I gave an interview about the uh, prostitution in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I was working in vice intelligence at the time. And I'm quoted in there probably five or six times. It's a big article, it's a half a page in a newspaper. And I looked at my Wikipedia page and it says, he claims to have worked vice intelligence, street crime, SWAT. And then they cite some news reporter from some organization and she did a lengthy check and she can't validate any of those positions. And here one of you <laughs> sent me a photo of a half page newspaper article. And that is usually the number one place that someone would go to validate someone's background, especially in public service. What a frigging joke. Again, trying to control the narrative, trying to keep people away from believing what I'm doing. Yeah. I, uh, I don't want to be, keep drag, banging the drum and making you, some of you upset, but I, I do believe it's an important cause because many of you will never experience what I've experienced working on a project, giving it 80 hours a week for 10 years of your life. And then having some people trash it like it's some piece of garbage. Frustrating. Now, 
Let's talk about one other frustrating part of this, and that is somebody on the review form talked about me using exaggerated terms to describe the disappearances. Oh, like it's a real mystery, and you know, oh, it's it's real. Uh, it's a dangerous place to go, and blah blah blah, and on and on and on. Well, got me mad because in the books I write. I cite the sources. And all the piece people have to do is go to that source and read that what I put down is what was said. And the superintendents of many parks on these disappearances have said things that are very concerning. And this next case I'm going to talk to you about, I'm telling you about it just for that reason. This man's name was Emerson Holt. 55 years old, missing June 18th, 1943 in Yosemite National Park. Yosemite has the biggest cluster of missing people in the world. No place is even close. Now, he was the vice president of a title company in Riverside, California. That's near Los Angeles. And he and a group of all male friends from the Sierra Club went to Yosemite to spend a couple days hiking and fishing. Well, Emerson and his friends started off from near Yosemite Village, and they were going to do a seven-mile hike up to a place called Lake Merced. And the hike traveled right next to the Merced River. The, uh, I'll show you what it looked like here. This is important. All that white you see, that's granite, exposed granite. And that's really what Yosemite was, is about. The number one place in the world probably has the most granite in the world. So they came up from this direction, hiked up through here. There's the trail, that's not a road. And they take the trail up to Lake Merced. Well, when Holt's taken this trail, essentially, I'm gonna give this scene a different form. They started in here, a place called Happy Isle. And then they started to hike, followed the Merced River. And at about this location in their hike, he could almost see the Merced High Sierra camp where he was going. They stop and take a rest. Emerson tells his friends that he doesn't feel well. And he says, my legs don't feel well. I just don't feel very good. And I'm going to rest and I'll meet you guys up the lake in a little bit. It's about you say, okay. Friends, there's no place to get lost. You just follow the creek or the river right up to the lake. And like the article said, he could almost see it. No place to go, no cliffs. The water was ankle deep, maybe flowing very slow, even though it was a river. He couldn't have gotten lost. That's what everyone said. But in a couple hours, he wasn't there. His friends turned around, went back, looked around, couldn't find him. Called for the National Park Service. They came out and do an eight-day massive search. Air, ground, everywhere. And when you think about it, it's in a cluster zone. Granted everywhere. Water right next to him. He was last in line point of separation. Nothing ever found. Ever found in an area that has thousands of hikers every year. Where could he go? There's no place to hide. I'm going to read you something. Now people say, oh, I use these exaggerated terms to make these cases more interesting. I'm going to show you the article when I'm done with it. This is from the Santa Maria Times, July 22nd, 1943. Search parties today continue to look for Emerson Holt, 55, of Riverside, whose disappearance in Yosemite National Park Monday was considered, quote, almost supernatural, end of quotes, by Park Superintendent Frank Kiptridge. He was last seen less than a mile from the camp beside the Merced River, but the water was only about a foot deep at that point. 
There were no cliffs in the vicinity over which he might have fallen. The words of Yosemite Park Superintendent, almost supernatural. And why did he say that? Because Emerson was a pillar of his community. He was with his buddies. Yet everything I've told you in the past about profile points exhibited itself in this disappearance. He had an illness or an injury. He was near water. He was on top of granite. He was in a cluster zone. He was last in line, and once that point of separation happened, Emerson vanished. What in the heck happened to Emerson Holt? Oh, you know, Plytus is just making this stuff up, and ah, he got drugged away by a mountain lion, ah, you know, right. Hilarious, except it involves somebody's life. The frustrating part is, I know you guys get it. I know you do. Because I get all the emails all the time saying, Dave, you've laid this out so many times. But sometimes I need to just hit some of you in the side of the head in a figurative term to allow you to know that even the people that are on scene that are very conservative with their words, like a park superintendent, can't help themselves but to say what they're really thinking. It's supernatural. Yeah. I've told this to you before in other cases where other park superintendents have said the same thing. I can, uh, I can only imagine what his family and friends thought. Him coming home, horrible. Horrible. Now, the next three cases I'm going to talk to you about, yeah, you're going to get a lot today. You're going to get a four of them. The next cases involve a series of men who disappear, and they're in the same area of British Columbia, Canada. Now, many of you know I wrote a book called Missing 411 Canada. And most of that book is about British Columbia because that's where most of these cases emanated from. Now, when you're a law enforcement man or woman and you have a series of missing persons cases, you need to go through them every couple months. And on each of those missing persons cases at the bottom, you should be writing down the predominant points in the case that make it unique. Age, sex, location, hobbies, married, single, uh, loyalty. Did he fool around on his wife? Or did she fool around on her husband? Or did he play or did she play in a criminal line or with a criminal element? Were they a very clean cut person? All these things. And if you did that as an investigator, and then all of a sudden at the end of the year, you have 16 mis missing persons cases. And if you care, you start putting these points together. I've never heard of these three cases put together by law enforcement in Canada. But I'm going to tell you that I'm going to give them to you right now. And the reason they're put together, there's a multitude, and you're going to be able to figure them out for yourself. First case involves a man named Dean Morrison. Now, Dean was 44 years old. On October 23, 2013, uh, and he was living at a place called Stump Lake Ranch, just outside of Stump Lake, British Columbia. And he was essentially a working ranch hand doing odd jobs for the ranch. Now, in the past, he had ran two regional newspapers. He's a smart man. And he was married, 
had a couple kids, but he had been separated for a while. There were comments made that Dean was depressed. Well, let me tell you something. Press flash. <laughs> when you're going through a divorce, there's a very good chance that one of you are going to be depressed. I can tell you that I was depressed. Not so much about getting away from her, but I missed my kids when I didn't have them for a week. So to say that he was depressed, that really doesn't mean anything to me. And he was depressed, okay. Now, he was working at the ranch, doing some odd jobs, and on October 22nd, 2013, he's painting some buildings. And later that afternoon, the people at the ranch say, hey, Dean, you know, it's not working out. We're gonna, we're gonna terminate your employment. There was no big yelling and screaming match that was ever reported. He grabs his stuff, goes over to his old truck, tries to start it, and it won't start. Calls for a tow truck, and something happened between the time he called the tow truck until the tow truck arrived. Obviously, Dean didn't have a vehicle. And the ranch was really on a plains-like setting, pretty flat. Tow truck got there, waited around, nobody came, so it left. Well, it was several days later, five days later, that Dean's sister reported him missing. Now, Dean was going to go live with his sister. They were close. He had been living on a trailer on the ranch. There were no hard feelings between he and the ranch. Well, Dean's family, this is Dean. Dean's family hires a private investigator. And I gotta say that I read a lot about this and they hired a good one. This firm came out and they did drone searches, ground searches, the ranch gave them 100% access to their property and said, we don't care where you go, search any place you want to, you know, we're not going to hide anything. We don't want to be hid anything to be hidden. We want him to be found if he's here. Well, there were tons of searches right after he disappeared and in the years pursuant to that, nothing. Trailer was searched and they were trying to understand what might have happened. Well, the PI said, yeah, there were reports he was depressed, but from everything about his profile and about Dean himself, the private investigator came out with a statement that he didn't think he committed suicide, which is strong because as an investigator, there are these things that you go through in working a person's profile to understand if they are suicidal. It's interesting that he's not. Now, he lost his job, but he, he was in contact with his sister and he was going to go live with her. They had a good relationship. But he had nowhere to go on that ranch. So where did he go? Now what's perplexing besides the disappearance is that I've told you before, if we put five people missing in six months from uh, an area with a 30 mile radius, I don't care, you could be the dumbest guy in the police department, you're gonna figure out, hmm, something's wrong. But if I spread these out, by years at a time, eh, things became hazy, you don't quite remember everything, you know, maybe things aren't as acute as they should be. Yeah, maybe. So, that was in 2013. Now let's, let's go up four years, 2017, October, and a man named Luke Neville, 48 years old, and he's four years older than Dean. Luke went missing October 9th, 2017 in a place called Spence's Bridge, British Columbia. He drove a 2003 uh, white Ford E250 Econoline van with windows. He was born in Montreal where he became a firefighter and he moved to Spence's Bridge and he became a home renovator. 
And from everything everyone could find in that community, they all loved him. And it wasn't a big city. It was like a couple hundred people. Now, he was unmarried, no kids. And on October 9th, his roommate hadn't heard from him. His roommate reported him missing to the police the following day, the RCMP. Now, this is Luke. So he renovated homes, had his own van, had a roommate, was reported missing. His van is found a couple days later, 20 kilometers from Spence's Bridge on a Forest Service road burned to the ground. And the RCMP said that Luke was not in the van. So could the van have caught on fire on its own? Don't know. Was the van torched? Maybe. Did Luke drive up in the van, hit a trail, go up into the woods, and then the van caught on fire, and then he died in the woods by an accident? It sounds pretty sketchy. The point is, Luke's gone, his van is destroyed, and nobody knows what's happened. And that's been over four years ago. Now, how did I get on to this series of cases? Now, that's a good question. So that area of British Columbia, know it real well. Kamloops is an area that uh, I worked with a guy when I was uh, working as a technology VP. He was from Kamloops. Kamloops isn't far from this area we're talking about. One thing I wanna insist on people to understand, when you go to a national park when you go to a woodsy area that's beautiful, a lot, of, a lot of individuals and families lose their minds. They put their common sense in their pocket and they don't think about the hazards that may exist around them. Folks, just because you're in a rural area, just because there's a lot of beauty around you, that does not, that does not mean that there isn't a serial killer living in the cabin down the road. Yeah. And this has happened. I'm not saying that's, what ha that's what's happening here. I'm saying it could happen. There's a man named Kerry Stainer who uh, was a serial killer that was living right near Yosemite at one point. And he victimized a daughter and her mom that were coming up there and probably had that, that attitude that they're in beauty and they let their guard down. I, it had to have been. But, on to the next case, and there are three here. Next case involved a man named Ben Tyner, T-Y-N-E-R, 32 years old. Ben was a gentle giant, as described by his family. 6'3", 240 pounds, a big man. And uh, lived on a, his family's ranch in Wyoming, and then wanted to see the world. And Ben spent time, when he can, when he could, traveling around and enjoying the world. At one point, he went to Russia and worked on a ranch for a year. He went to Australia and met friends there and traveled. Ben wasn't a hick. Ben was well-rounded. But he also knew ranching. He knew horses. He knew the mountains. And he knew survival, especially in bad weather because Wyoming has some of the worst weather in the U.S. at times. Windy, cold, woo! Now, Ben, ben lived in a place called Merritt, British Columbia, M-E-R-R-I-T-T. -T. On January 11th of 2019, there was a place called the Murray United Church in Merritt. You can look it up, Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y, United Church, Merritt, British Columbia. Beautiful church, 140 years old. Somebody decided to light and burn the church to the ground. Don't know why. That same night, on January 11th, another church in that same town was torched, partially burnt. 
Now the Murray United Church was right next to the offices of Nicola Ranch that hired Ben Tyner as their ranch manager. They had an office in town where they sold things. So this church that burned down was right next door, which is weird. Very weird and coincidental. Now, here's the Nicola Ranch sign, and that church in the background is the Murray United Church that's no longer there. Now, in a very weird coincidence, CTV, Canadian Television, went into Murray, or Merritt, and they happened to run into Ben. And they interviewed him about what that church meant to the community. And he gave a really good interview. It's on, you can watch it, CTV. Ben Tyner, T-Y-N-E-R. So, Ben does the interview. Then on January 26th, he has a day off from the ranch. And he gets on his horse, and it's the horse that he brought up from Wyoming that he owned. And he rides in an easterly direction away from the ranch up into the mountains. The thought was maybe he was looking for cattle. Maybe it was his afternoon off and he just wanted to ride with he and his buddy his horse. I don't know. We'll never know. But he rode off and he didn't come back. And on January 28th, when he didn't show up for work at the ranch, he's reported as a missing person. Well, the RCMP come in and they start searching. So the area where the men are missing is this area, the general area, centered on merit. It's about 80 miles from the U.S. border. It's about 100 air miles from Vancouver. Here's Kelowna, Vernon, Penticton. Beautiful country right here. That's Ben. And I gotta tell you, I heard the name Ben and it perked my ears up. I was paying attention. So in that area where he disappeared, it was described as being some active logging in and around the area. They found his horse a couple days later, completely rigged with everything Ben would have put on it. Saddle, reins, everything as it should be, but no Ben. Now the RCMP initially classified this case as not suspicious, no foul play. And I remember when it came out, a lot of people sent this to me saying, Dave, what's up with this? And I just kind of sat on my hands and didn't say anything. And then three months afterwards, they called in the major crimes unit about it. I probably would have done that a bit sooner. So let's look at the map, and this is going to tell you everything you need to know. So... His horse was found on the backside of Swakam Mountain, just outside of Merritt, BC. And, here's Merritt right here. The ranch is right here. He rode up into this area. There's a lot of water, a lot of small lakes and things through here. And then his horse is found on the backside of Swakam Mountain. This is Stump Lake. This is Spence's. So, the ranch, this is Lower Nicola, Merritt, Primary Nicola, the ranch. He rode up and over, or across and over, or he took his car, and they could, that's another suspicious part of this. They're not sure if he took his truck or he rode up there. And they're not saying either. So, here's my twist on all this. First of all, they made a mistake by not getting on this sooner. 
If you knew Ben Tyner, then you knew that he was a very, very smart, knowledgeable, credible cowboy, ranch manager. Horses are going to throw him. He's not going to get hurt. He's not going to go up into the country and get off his horse and his horse run off. Something happened. Something happened. Now, when I was doing the background on him at 6'3", 240 pounds, it's a pretty big man. If you were a smaller man and you had a beef with Ben Tyner, you're not going to go beat him up with your fists. <laughs> Sorry, that's not going to happen. So what would you do? Well, if you knew that he liked to go into the backcountry and you were a killer, you'd set up with a rifle somewhere. When his horse rides by, you just take him off with the rifle, throw his body in the back of the truck and cart him away, put him somewhere that'll never be found. If I was the RCMP, I'd take that s the reins of the horse. I would take the saddle and I would do blood splatter testing on everything on that saddle and that reins on that leather. If he was shot on that horse, there's some evidence on that saddle and reins that he was shot. There's so much area out there to cover, it would be almost impossible to determine where he was shot. I'm not saying that happened, but I'm saying that's what I would be thinking probably. Now, during the search for him, they actually called it off short because it was minus 25 degrees when they were out there. That's how cold it is out there in parts of BC in the winter. So let's look at these three men for a second. You got three cases. The men are 32 to 48 years old. Ben being the youngest. Ben being the one that's happened most recently. All of them were living alone. Could it be important? Could be. They all disappeared in rural locations. And the proximity to each other is important. There's a geographical proximity. Let's go back to this. So Luke disappeared in Spence's right here, right? That was in 2017. Now, Dean, 2013 over here. And Ben, right in the middle. Now, 35 miles, that's the diameter of these cases. Interesting to me. That that's the most recent and that's right in the middle. Are they related? Hmm. RCMP has said no. Well, they may have some evidence that they're not making public that they may not be. No body was found in any of the cases. So Morrison's case was 13, 2013, Neville was 2017, and Ben was 2019. You got four years between one case and two years between another, and a total of six years between all three cases. If I'm the RCMP detective, I'm gonna go back a little further in time and check a little, little more of the missing persons cases from this area, maybe open up that radius of cases to bring in the next jurisdiction to see if there's somebody missing. Oddly enough, all these people disappeared with supposedly no witnesses anywhere. That's pretty weird. Do I think that these are criminal or 411 cases? Again, for the RCMP to bring in their major crimes unit on Ben Tyner's case, they have some evidence that something's really wrong and they're not making it public and they're not talking about it. So, don't know. That's why sometimes I'm reluctant to stick my foot in my mouth 
if I'm not really sure, and I'm not really sure on these three, there's a very good chance that none of these men will ever be found. Or if they are ever found, it'll be a complete fluke and accident. Now, Ben's family did a video. And I think it was on CTV. And it was at the bottom of one of the news articles about Ben. And it was his mom and his dad and his brother. And they talked about Ben. Talked about it. His dog was there in the family room because he left it behind when he went up to work at Nicola Ranch. Talked about what a good soul he was and how much they missed him. Wow. You know, it's weird the way we, we lose people in this world that really seem like they're good souls. And why these three men disappeared from our earth and we can't find them is troubling to me. Whether it's a serial killer in British Columbia or it's an oddity, don't know. But I'll leave you with one more thing. Remember the Emerson Holt case from Yosemite. I did not bring up the supernatural comment. That was the superintendent of Yosemite National Park. And if he's the person who was the middle of that investigation from start to finish, and he thought it was supernatural, then why wouldn't anyone else in this world think the same thing? Yeah. Friends, I greatly appreciate your support and the many of you that left comments and reviews on Amazon, I appreciate it very much. Hopefully good comments, bad comments, as long as they are factual comments about my books, I don't care what you write. Anything to overcome the lies that are constantly being thrown at me from various people, I appreciate it. So, as we start another week, keep your head up. The sun's going to come up tomorrow. Know that our community is going to support you. And know that I really appreciate you. Thank you.